Ave Maria, gratia plena Dominus Tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tu Iesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hor mortis nostre. Ab, nomine Pazis et Filii, Spiritus Sancti, Amen. Carissimi beloved in Christ, welcome to this broadcast Mass on this, the feast, as we said, of St. Luke the Evangelist. We might say the author of the Gospel of Mercy and Love. St. Luke is dear to us because of his two books, the third Gospel, which bears his name, and of course the Acts of the Apostles. The Acts of the Apostles in particular is dear to liturgists because it portrays so well the spirit of the ancient church, which gave birth to the liturgy. Luke was a companion and co-laborer of Paul, and Paul's spirit too is reflected in his writings. Luke was by birth a Gentile, by vocation a physician, and he hailed from Antioch. See Colossians 4 verse 14. Luke embraced the faith at some unrecorded occasion, but no doubt from the ministry and preaching of St. Paul. We first meet him as a disciple and fellow traveller of St. Paul during the Apostle's second missionary journey. The so-called we sections of the Acts from chapter 16, 20, 21 to 27 prove that he accompanied the great Apostle until Paul's first imprisonment in Rome. The Acts of the Apostles may well have been written during that two-year period. Luke remained unmarried and is said to have reached the ripe old age of 84. He died as a martyr at Patera in Archaea and was buried at Thebes in Boeotia. In the year 357, his remains, together with those of the Apostle Andrew, were transferred to Constantinople at the bidding of the Emperor Constantine. Various cities, such as Venice and Padua, claimed to possess his relics. The Gospel of St. Luke may have originated in the following manner. Because the Apostle Paul did not know the Saviour personally, and because he converted very little with the chosen twelve or with the disciples who had followed Christ, he charged Luke, certainly the best educated among his followers, to write the life and deeds of Jesus. Luke gathered all the extant records. He did not confine himself to the two Gospels already written, Matthew and Mark, but drew from other sources, both written and oral. For eyewitnesses of the acts of Jesus were still living. Undoubtedly, he consulted the Apostles, especially St. John, assuredly also the Blessed Virgin Mary. Thus he became qualified to author a precious volume, one which someone has praised as the most lovable book ever written. In St. Luke's Gospel, our Saviour is pictured as the merciful physician of bodily and spiritual ills. It has therefore been called the Gospel of Mercy and Love. The beautiful passages of God's loving kindness touch us deeply. For example, the parables of the prodigal son and the good Samaritan. The account of the penitent woman and the good thief on the cross. Of inestimable value are the first two chapters on the incarnation and childhood of Jesus. Here Luke preserved for us the three precious canticles that we pray daily now in the, Holy, in the divine office. The Benedictus, the Magnificat and the Nunc Dimittis. In these two chapters, Luke describes our Blessed Mother so vividly that a legend arose making him an artist who painted a picture of the Virgin. Certainly, this detail lacks some historical information, but the Gospel does provide excellent insights into Mary's soul. And for as far back as anyone can remember, the depiction in iconography from the East of Our Lady with the Child Jesus 
has long been believed to have derived from an original painting of by St. Luke of the Blessed Virgin and has been faithfully represented ever since. Certainly, the theme of good news for the poor and for the outcast, for those who are outside, particularly of uh, Judeo society, comes across very strongly in St. Luke's Gospel. St. Luke's Gospel contains 18 other parables and healings than those of the Synoptic Gospels. Perhaps as a physician he had a particular interest in these, but clearly also he had an interest both from the perspective of being a Gentile himself, having a concern for the poor. It is he, for example, enlisting the Beatitudes, who says, blessed are the poor, and doesn't add in spirit. And certainly, there is great emphasis in the narrative of St. Luke. For example, in those first two chapters, it is St. Luke who describes to us the proclamation of the good news to the shepherds at Bethlehem, announcing the arrival of the Incarnation. Shepherds at that time in Jewish society were only a half step above pig farmers. Shepherds were not generally regarded as uh, desirable company, in part because of the nature of their occupation. They were always out and about. They could not keep themselves ritually clean. They were generally perhaps unsociable kinds of people. Their whole work, their whole life, their whole occupation was spent out in the fields, traversing the hills and the mountains with the sheep. The sheep indeed were their only company, really. When a shepherd came back into town or village from work, you could smell him before you could see him. He had the smell of the sheep about him. And yet it was to such as these, according to St. Luke, and presumably according to the Blessed Virgin, that God sent first the glorious proclamation of the Gospel, that whole host of angels that appeared to those shepherds keeping watch over their flocks by night, as the translation and the hymn so beautifully renders it. And throughout Luke's Gospel, we can see other distinctions in the narrative from his Gospel, from the others, where a clear emphasis on the poor and the outcast and on healing is made. Christ is, of course, the physician of our souls. In the Gospels, and in St. Luke's Gospel particularly, we see how our Lord not only heals the sick physically, but also, importantly, spiritually. So often saying, your faith has healed thee, or your faith has made thee whole. So often in response to those who cry out to him, begging mercy, begging pity, expressing repentance and contrition. If you've been listening to the daily meditations from Bishop Richard Challoner recently, you'll notice in the last couple of days, 
our reflections have been turned toward purity. This is something, my brothers and sisters, we cannot escape from. That we as Christians are called to purity, to live pure lives. And this in stark contrast to the prurient world in which we live. A world which is, um, a world which is obsessed with sex and sexuality and a world that is pressing us to accept all manner of contrary behaviours to those prescribed by the gospel, wishing us, coercing us and perhaps not like, not uh, perhaps soon not just coercing, but imposing us to recognize and accept these behaviors and bless them. There are even voices abroad within the church echoing the zeitgeist. But the gospel is clear. Purity is required of us all as Christians. Married or unmarried, we are all called to chastity. We are all called to purity. Purity of heart and mind and purity of body and soul. The wonderful thing about our great physician, Jesus, is that he can heal us, even of our impurity. We've only, we've only to approach with a contrite and humble heart. But as Christians, as baptized people, we were made holy. Remember, my brothers and sisters, that you and I, by virtue of our baptism, were made as holy as any consecrated cathedral, basilica, church or chapel. You and I were made as holy as any consecrated chalice and pattern. You and I are as holy as any saint's relic. You and I, by virtue of our baptism, were made holy. And not just our souls, but our bodies too. And which is why St. Paul particularly reminds us constantly to strive for purity so that we do not commit sacrilege and blasphemy. Every time we use ourselves for our own end, we are committing sacrilege. Just think about that for a moment. Every time we abuse ourselves, every time we do not use ourselves in the way that God commands and Christ teaches us, we are committing sin, but the sin is actually sacrilege. It's blasphemy. Remember St. Paul, do not know that your body is a temple for the Holy Spirit 
Every time then we abuse this temple of the body, we are blaspheming against the Spirit of God. We mar the image of Him in whom we were created. And so we see that St. Luke emphasizes, who of course was a companion of St. Paul, we see that St. Luke emphasizes the healing both of body and soul. So the question we must ask ourselves, how often do we appeal ourselves to God's mercy through genuine contrition and repentance? Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, our Lord tells us. Do you strive on a daily basis after that perfection? Do you allow yourself to be redeemed where perhaps you have fallen away? Do we avail ourselves of God's grace, of God's mercy, of God's healing? Of course, whenever possible, we should avail ourselves of the guaranteed means of God's grace through the sacraments, through the sacrament of penance and Eucharist, known as the restorative sacraments. But we must also face the reality, my brothers and sisters, that in today's crisis, access to the sacraments is difficult and is going to become likely more difficult. In many ways, the pandemic was a rehearsal How then might you avail yourself of God's grace and healing and restorative power if you are unable to receive the sacraments on a frequent basis or even easily? Well then it does all come down to your personal faith. You must find within you the belief and the trust necessary to accept Christ's promises, to believe his word. If you are unable to receive the sacrament of penance, make an act of self-examination of conscience and confess directly to God from your heart. Afterwards make a sincere act of contrition and all the while believe that the God whom you address is listening but not only listening is willing to forgive you know my brothers and sisters often part of the problem that even the most regular penitent 
who is able to receive the sacrament of penance, a common condition is that so few of us are prepared to accept the forgiveness. It is certainly true that one of the benefits of being able to make one's confession to a priest is to hear the comfortable words of absolution as an affirmation of one's forgiveness. But perhaps in these trying times, God is testing us to really prove our faith and belief and trust in him. We often underestimate, too, the effect, indeed, that sin can have upon us. We often miss, for example, the effect that it can have physiologically when we are racked by guilt, when we are consumed by shame. when we can be crippled by our consciences. All these things literally can manifest themselves in our physiology. They can affect our mood. They can affect our temperament. They can even manifest physically. We all too often underestimate the effect and the power of sin. The, sh the sadness, my brothers and sisters, of so many people living miserable lives because of unrepented sin, because of unconfessed sin, because of a life compounding sin upon sin upon sin upon sin. And that's just the Christian. Do not fear they who can kill the body, but him who has power to kill both the soul and the body. And this is why Another aspect, another dimension to St. Luke's writings in both his Gospel and his Acts of the Apostles is surely joy. Joy at the prospect of the Kingdom of God. Joy at the prospect of forgiveness, of healing, of restoration, of holiness, of heaven. real joy, and perhaps because of his physicianship, St. Luke particularly knew and could recognize the physical symptoms and effect of sin and misery 
in people's lives. As we said, it is from Luke's Gospel that we receive the three canticles that frame our day. The Benedictus, the Magnificat and the Dante Dimittis. All three songs of hope, all three songs of joy, all three songs that any sinner can recite and find the possibility of grace revealed. As we've said before, the Christian life is about striking a balance, an equilibrium between the spiritual and the material, between the heavenly and the earthly. But also, too, in our perception and appreciation of this life. For as much joy and as much relief and as much happiness may be experienced by those who are pure and holy, equally as much misery and despair and desperation and embitterness can be experienced by those who are unshriven, unforgiven, unconfessed. And there perhaps has never been any greater need than now for the gospel of love and redemption, of forgiveness and restoration, of healing of both body and soul. Throughout the pandemic, people were very concerned about their physical health. A great imbalance was inflicted upon us by the prohibition of us being able to access our places of worship. And so there is a great levelling up, to quote, to use a political term, there is a great need for a levelling up in our society. A levelling up of an appreciation for the spiritual over the physical. To bring things back to a balance in order to achieve real healing of the post-traumatic stress that we are in fact all of us pretty much enduring and which is why we ourselves must practice what we preach why we ourselves must strive for purity, for holiness. Why we ourselves must believe in the promises of Christ. Why we ourselves must live according to the commandments of God. And we must do so visibly, demonstrably, manifestly, in order to be as Christ calls us to be, Lights to the world, salt of the earth. So that he may draw people to himself through his likeness in us. 
who now are his hands and his feet, who now are his vocal heralds of his word of healing and redemption. We, my brothers and sisters, are called ourselves to follow after the example of the saints, to follow after the apostles, to follow after the evangelists. We, like St. Luke, are called to share our joy and our insights and our testimony for the salvation of others. Let us paint within the sanctuaries of our hearts within the temples of our bodies, a sacred image of the incarnation after the fashion of Saint Luke. Let us paint our icon of Jesus with Mary, his pure mother, the example to us of how to become like him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.